everybody, thanks for checking out the Chris Gethard Show podcast. That's really um, cool that you're checking this out. We're about to do, I think, the dumbest show we've done in years. His life would be trash! Hey, you better believe I'm trashed. <laughs> we are, uh, scrappy trash people. What's the point of this show? I just turned it on. We've always been with we've this show. We've always been trash people. We will always be trash people. It's true. This doesn't feel real. Live from my mother's basement, Chris Gethard's enigmatic social media posts are the reason that I cannot sleep at night. We are Trash People. This is the podcast where we review old episodes of the Chris Gethard show, the public access version, to let you know if you should watch them. I'm Emily Pineapple. I'm Judge Robin. And I'm Forrest, the keeper of the canon. And today we are discussing episode 10, the human crane episode, which uh, aired on August 24th of 2011. The musical guest was MC Chris, and our panel included Chris Gethard, Connor Ratliff, the human fish, uh, who Chris calls the breakout star of the show, George Clareman, Random Gene, Shannon O'Neill, and Patrick Castles uh, from College Humor. And he said that being on public access is like a fulfilling a dream that he never knew that he had. Uh, The theme for the game was the human crane, uh, in which Drew Johnson and George uh, hold Geth upside down and blindfold him. Uh, He then tries to pick up Tchotchke from the audience member who who is directing this human crane uh, with his mouth. Also, uh, Tchotchke is not spelled with a T. I, I googled it. You Googled it? Wait, Tchotchke is spelled yeah, with a T? That's how, that's... I'm pretty sure Tchotchke is spelled with a T. Tchotchke is spelled with a T? Yep. That's where that that's where that ch comes from. There's a ch in Tchotchke? I was just as surprised as you were. I just knew I didn't know how to spell it. What? To be fair, I would have put a K there. Kachachkakiti? Kachachki? All right. The theme for the calls this episode was... Are you an insomniac? Have you ever stayed awake for so long that you have lost your mind? And are you a sleepwalker with a sub question being, do you have any creative ways to murder insects? Of which only one caller uh, provided a response. And this is just in the continuing theme of Chris Gethard cannot fall the fuck asleep. Um, I didn't expect that to become a whole arc of the show. Like a whole mini arc about will he ever get to sleep again? Will Chris Gethard ever sleep? Well, he's a father now, so the answer is no. Um, Also, the answer before that was no. (laughs) And the answer after that, probably going to be no. Yep, probably going to be no. Uh, Spoilers. (laughs) So tell me, friends, have you ever stayed awake so long that you felt like you were going crazy? Or are you insomniacs? I think that the amount of times I have found you asleep on our couch, Robin, uh, tells me that no, you are not. Oh, no, I have, like, the amazing gift that I can fall asleep in, like, 30 seconds, almost anywhere. It's fantastic. Do you sleep? Do you ever, like, have you ever sleptwalked? Uh, no, I get sleep paralysis, like, maybe once a year. Um, Oh, wow. Yeah, I don't know if you guys know what sleep paralysis is, but it's this whole thing where you, like, you're like your brain function kicks back in, but your body function hasn't, so you're just like conscious and paralyzed. And it's usually uh joined by hallucinations of like someone being in your room trying to like do you harm. I get the opposite of that a fair amount. I get where I'm dreaming and I know that I'm dreaming. I know that I'm in bed and I cannot wake up. I go through oh, a weird. loop of opening my eyes in my bed and then getting out of bed or struggling to get out of bed and then something you know absurd Mm. will be in the situation which will almost immediately tip me off that i am still in fact asleep and i just like circle and circle and circle and circle sounds unpleasant i I mean yeah i've never done that sleep paralysis is like pretty bad like it's like 30 seconds of just like panicking your ass off the weirdest one i ever had was uh i i got it once at home and i opened my eyes and see like the silhouette of a figure just like leaning over my bed and then he kind of walks into my peripheral so i can't see him and then i regain motor function i'm like well that was unpleasant (laughs) (laughs) and that part your heart's like beating super hard you're like well that's you know i'm like 
might as well watch TV now. Like, I, I'm not getting back to bed anytime soon. <laughs> <laughs> really ruins her day. What about you, Forrest? I mean, I just, like, don't sleep. I mean, I do sleep. Sorry, what? I don't dream. I sleep, mm-hmm. but I don't dream. Mm-hmm. And so, like, I, I definitely can be an insomniac, but it's generally because I'm, like, on the internet too much and can't sleep. It's not very exciting. Yeah, the only... Sounds more like you won't sleep. Could, well, but then I can't because I didn't. And so I get all... Mm. I start thinking about how to respond to this tweet or what else it might be on Reddit, and it just gets to be a problem. People on the internet are wrong about Star Wars. Or right and need support. So yeah, let's get right into this episode. Um... You know, I have some feelings about it, uh, but Random Jean's feeling was that it's fun, actually, uh, when she's introduced on the panel. <laughs> so that was pretty excellent. I uh, do think the Chris Gethard show should have used that as their tagline for a little while. It's fun, actually. <laughs> yeah, we find out that uh, that the question of what the theme of the show is was of course never answered did you you answer a question as to why you're doing the show (laughs) we have never answered that question (laughs) nor will it ever be answered except perhaps by the fact that chris gethard can't sleep therefore the show um we find out that i didn't sleep for the first 48 hours and one of my eyes turned off that's true yeah. What do I do if my eye never turns back on? <laughs> like, it was long enough for me to think that. I would think seizure immediately. Yeah, I would be kind of concerned uh, if my eyes suddenly stopped working. But a lot of worse things have happened to Chris, I think. Doesn't he even get bleeding hemorrhoids, like, every season of the show? He, he has talked about that. Yeah, I don't know if he did at this point, but he talked about it later on. That that was, like, it was a hard thing to deal with while having to coordinate a whole cable tv show yeah bleeding hemorrhoids not fun we find out another insane thing about gene it was just when she like casually mentions she has a trust fund (laughs) that does happen this episode um that's what i thought you meant too no she says and this is what's funny about it is she says that she did a sleep study where they keep you awake for a number of hours and like study you because she was so desperate for money and i'm like ooh, that trust fund is attached to a still living human or at least at that time uh i think that used to be a thing people did though like people used to do that like a lot more where they'd go do like 50 dollar studies to get cash Mm mm-hmm I mean, I also, it also is an interesting thing to have done. And so I'm not surprised that a person who would come on to a random cable show would also give that a try to see what it's like. Just be like, what happens? Yeah. Because like, wonder I, I've wondered what. what sleep studies are like. Hey, man, if I wasn't privileged, I probably would have done it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Gene has a trust fund. That's why I wonder if curiosity is a big part of it too. I would I would maybe if I don't know. I've never had good results staying up super long. Of course I've done it um and just felt shitty. Just felt real shitty. I mean it's like a actual form of torture too, so mm-hmm. Uh, so our first caller was Christy from Long Island, uh, the same Christy who had called a previous week and had nothing to say, unfortunately. Um, and she is the one who suggested to Chris the ways of murdering flies. Uh, if you take hairspray and you spray it with hairspray, its wings get stuck together and it can't fly. And then it's like walking and it slows it down and then you could kill it. She said that she prefers to do that so that she can capture the fly and not drown it in hairspray and then throw it outside because that like assuages her moral guilt much like like Egyptian uh, pharaohs who would murder their family members by locking them alive in sarcophagi or whatever and then piling the sand on so that they didn't technically murder that person the suffocation did that sounds like you know I stabbed you with a knife and it's like I didn't I didn't kill you. The knife going into you killed you. Yeah, Judge Robin, would that do you think that would stand up 
in a court. I didn't kill I'm, them. I'm only a judge of comedy. Oh, I'm no. sorry. I'm sorry. You're right. You're right. I shouldn't try to get you outside of your area of expertise. We then uh, introduced this game, this human crane game. Now, correct me if I'm wrong for it. Wrong, Forrest. Um, this appears again, doesn't it? The human crane gag. Yes. And with a lot higher uh, rate of success. For example, the song. Who? Okay, I'm gonna play for us the the human crane song. Scale crane is an ale crane. Punky punky. <laughs> what Deckard is a human crane? Are they parodying a song? I don't know what that is. I feel like they're definitely parodying something. Um, but yeah, it's just like that over and over again. Um, they get to pick from a pile of things on the ground. Uh, the first person, who was the first person up? It was Matt Mercer, I think is what they said. He's having a hard time choosing because it's a pile of shit. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Yeah, it was great. It was things like a bedazzled flip-flops, a toilet brush. A signed headshot of Chris Gethard. Uh, signed headshots of the human fish. Oh, sorry. Wait, was it human fish? Also Gethard. Oh, sorry. Okay, okay. Also Gethard. Um. <laughs> wait, did you say it was Matt Mercer? Yeah, that's what I thought that's what they said. But yeah, so he goes up, Geth is held upside down, and is forced to beg for his life. Please don't break my neck. Uh, and, and that's when, uh, Connor Ratliff comes out. Um, I will say like this episode, Connor, uh, or Gethard endorses Connor. Yeah. That was a big moment. Endorsing a, a third party candidate. Funny back in 2011. <laughs> yes. There are a lot of things in this episode that were very funny in 2011 yeah like like mc chris's whole race war thing oh oh yeah that was a very race wars chill out it's not about the real race wars that are happening today Mm. that was a lot a lot more of like a oh what a wacky joke in 2011 chill out it's not about a bunch of races killing each other live although that sounds pretty good and that could happen so go check out my live show this fall race wars tour Oh, MC Chris, how prescient you were. It's not his fault that he's an oracle. (laughs) Um, But yeah, that's when Geth endorses Connor. And we learn that uh, Gene has a trust fund. Random Gene's got a trust fund. Oh, yeah, that's when um, Patrick learns that trust funds are a real thing. Which, which is pretty great, but Gene, of course, uh, uh, qualifies it for everyone. Uh, my trust fund isn't seven figures, I'll tell you oh. that much. Not seven, no. Definitely not seven figures of trust fund. I, like, have, do you guys know anyone with a trust fund? I have, I think I have a trust fund. I have known people with trust, trust fund. Trust fund, Emily. <laughs> trust fund. I don't really know what a trust fund is. There was it's money. It's like a large sum of money you can't uh, you can't access to like you graduate college. Oh, I thought it was like inheritance. Yeah, I it's mean... like a it's like an inheritance with a stipulation, I believe. And the stipulation isn't just when the person who has this money dies. No, it's like a, you can only spend it on. Like, okay. A certain thing. I do not have a trust fund. These things I have learned. Oh, it's it's sorry, I just looked it up. It's uh it's it's managed by a third neutral party. So it's controlled. Oh. Yeah, it's like where the president's businesses are supposed to be in a blind trust. <laughs> right, let's not get let's not get too political. I'm just saying Connor Ratliff would put his his businesses in a blind trust. <laughs> I mean, certainly run by other 35-year-olds, just to not... Uh, well, now, the founders didn't say that the bankers have to be 35. <laughs> they said presidents have to be 35. We'll have to find some other authority who says the ideal age for banking. <laughs> anyway, the whole thing with the trust fund is, I believe, it's it's you get it under like certain stipulations. Like, you have to go to college, you have to graduate. Mm. Sometimes it can only be spent on certain things. Sometimes it like, can only be spent on education. Hmm. Hmm. I think it's a really East Coast kind of thing because they got that like old money. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I I have no idea if anyone I knew out here. I came from like a very rich part of town in California, and I assume that some of the kids I went to school with had trust funds. Oh yeah, I know your high school. They all had trust funds. <laughs> I also came from the same rich part of town, but I went to public school there. Ooh. So I, I'm a man I'm a man of the people. <laughs> I definitely didn't go to school with anyone who had a trust fund. Are you sure? Well they actually had their high own school school. High school maybe. High school maybe. Well, no, okay, I didn't graduate with anyone who had a trust fund. <laughs> you didn't graduate from your high school. No, I didn't. I did graduate from high school, but from a different high school program. <laughs> so uh, let's check in with Alyssa. Anyone want to check in with Alyssa? Alyssa of Three Busy Debras, which is about to be uh, or we don't debuting. Know. We don't know when it's going to debut, but it did get ordered to a series. It will debut yes. eventually on Adult Swim. Everyone, check out Alyssa. Who does, who does she play on it? One of the busy Debras. Mm-hmm. Oh, she plays Debra? Oh, cool. Yeah. She's yeah, a one of the titular Debras. <laughs> um, anyway, so Alyssa calls. Um, she just, like, can't sleep. She had one of her kind of rambling. Anyway, I'm going to move past that. I'm just going to get straight to Shannon because Shannon's the best part of every Alyssa call. <laughs> yeah, I tried masturbating. Um, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Shannon gives Alyssa some great advice. Well, okay. The advice itself is sound. The the method delivery, maybe not so much. But... Have you tried masturbating? Well, she she shouldn't have posed it as a question, as she later comes to. She does realize the error of her ways after Chris is utterly scandalized by the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> I like um... Jean just being like, "So how was Disney World?" Just like we're not we're and not gonna. She was on point again. She was on point. Yeah. Bring the show back. Yeah, that was great. Mm-hmm. I I appreciated that. Uh, Alyssa lets us all know that it's okay that Shannon has been saying such inappropriate things. Um, the phrase, I'll be fine, is completely transparent. I'll be fine is the title of a Lifetime original movie. <laughs> She'll be fine. She'll be fine. I just want to throw it out there that uh, I watch a lot of Lifetime original movies. I'll be fine is not the name of one of them. Ooh. Are you a big Lifetime head? Uh, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> I had like I once had like like six hours left in Vegas and we we're like a block away from the strip and instead of going to the strip we started watching like a lifetime movie and we almost missed our we like gotten like a roll and almost missed our flight. <laughs> <laughs> um we then get our second human fish question. The first one was Boom boom pow <laughs> versus Cha cha cha, and I think it was cha 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 that won. Uh, and then this is the second one, which is uh, inappropriate behavior <laughs> versus uh, men behaving badly, starring Rob Schneider. And I actually looked up men behaving badly. Well, that's a good thing you looked it up. Emily. Oh. It is time for the segment. I think I named fishy questions at one point. Fishy explanations. Emily, fishy explanations. That's correct. Of which we Emily, still uh, don't have a sound drop. I mean, we. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, um, Emily. I'm really curious about what he meant here. Can Can you tell us a little more? Definitely, definitely. So we have a. Uh, this was directly on the heels of. Shannon acting, as Chris would put it, inappropriately by asking a teenager if they masturbate instead of merely suggesting that the teenager masturbate. Um, and it's so one can one can say that he's definitely referring to inappropriate behavior generally. Now, men behaving badly is a, according to Wikipedia, set in Indianapolis, Indiana, the show starred Rob Schneider and some other people who were college buddies sharing an apartment and living out a second childhood, much to the chagrin, (laughs) much to the chagrin of Kevin's girlfriend, Sarah. Kevin 
being the lead character, I suppose. Uh, and it is reviewers found the show's content to be too risque, pushing its brand of gross out humor beyond but all the raciest cable shows of the day. Citation is needed for that uh, declaration, of course, on Wikipedia. But we're talking about we're talking about inappropriate behavior in itself versus men specifically behaving poorly. And much like the show's uh, uh, raciness and much like the sexual assault uh, that the human fish suffered in the last episode, which is also why he's wearing a T-shirt today. What, what is it? Ho, 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 burp. Yes, that is his iconic shirt this episode. Because a man pantsed him last episode, a group of men in probably the most sort of masculine of situations, which is a group of men all performing competitively with their bodies, um, of course, in a breakdancing <laughs> troupe, which, like, of types of dancing, I would say that it's like that and then that that Russian dancing where the people put like beers on their heads and have to like move around with their legs super like far up and do all of that squatting but keep the beers from falling from a uh, fiddler on the roof as those are tied for the most masculine forms of dancing. I mean this one's this one's like pretty easy, Robin. It's just that men are men are shitty when when performed masculinely, inappropriate behavior sucks. But inappropriate behavior in itself can be comedic, but like wait, when but, Shannon does it. Well, it was between it was between this or like. Bah, bah, bah. I was totally expecting you to pick that one. But also, you, it sounds like you're saying inappropriate behavior should have won, but Fish said mm. men behaving badly wins. And that's because the world always awards men. Uh, it doesn't matter mm. how funny Shannon is or how legit her exchanges with uh with Alyssa are like like her exchanges with Alyssa are 100 percent within the confines of like this comedic exchange like Alyssa doesn't really respond but like she's obviously not like uncomfortable with it to the point where like she's not calling back or I feel like I don't know what goes on behind the scenes but I don't think that Shannon would make a young woman feel uncomfortable if there was like a legitimate, like, like she told Chris that it made her feel uncomfortable and she didn't want to call again. Like, but Chris is always shitting on Shannon as if he's afraid for himself. He's saying, I've talked to Alyssa's mother. Like, I've done all these things to make sure that this is a nice, wholesome experience for this young woman. And yet Shannon is getting shit on. It's a man's world. And yet all these dancers can come on and just sexually assault the human fish. And it's no big deal. I mean, the band, that dance troupe does never come back on the show. That is true. Like, I think Emily, Emily everything you're saying makes a lot of sense. It just would sound more compelling if a dude was saying it. Just... <laughs> <laughs> like, Forrest, can you repeat that? Um, yeah. So, like. The world rewards men who behave badly. Oh, you know that makes really good way sense over voice. when women behave badly. I like or are I funny. like how not shrill your voice is. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Says the guy with the highest pitch voice in the room. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, speaking of high pitch voices, let's talk about our musical guest. Yeah. So our musical guest comes on, MC Chris. Uh, who listened to MC Chris? I did. I did. I loved MC Chris when Fet's Vet first came out. He also had Hoodie Ninja, which is the one that I recognized. I I really don't like nerdcore, so I'm gonna shut up. Well, that's you know what's funny about that is uh, neither did MC Chris. I looked him up because I actually, like, I hadn't heard of him, really. I had heard, of course, like, those songs. Um, but he 
had previously lashed out at the media for focusing on the more nerdcore scene than his music, as well as the nerdcore community as a whole, uh, and then had to apologize to the nerdcore community um, for the aforementioned conflicts. Um, And he ended up, uh, this is the quote, which I thought was nice. He said, in the beginning, I felt like I was way more of an individual and not part of anything. And that it's nice that a lot of folks consider me part of it. It's actually embarrassing how I used to think that I was the only one playing with Star Wars toys and making music. And it just wasn't true. Uh, I absolutely have no problem with the label now. He's made so many records. That's another thing that I learned uh, isn't it that right, Force Keeper of the Canon? How many has he put out? Yeah, I had no idea that he was that prolific. He's put out. You can also pay him a thousand dollars. Basically, like fifteen albums, and he's been putting out an album a year essentially since like uh, since two thousand and nine or two thousand and ten. So he's really active. Yeah, it's crazy. He's also been a voice on like Adult Swim shows. He did the uh, original lyrics too. Um, the theme song for Aqua Team Hunger Force. Uh, for $1,000, he will do your podcast theme or do 16 bars of music or do all of that for free if he knows you. Um, if you want a whole song, it's $2,000. Oh, wow. You can pay him $2,000. $1 to $2,000 for venue I think it's appearance. One, one to 2000 Yeah. <laughs> It's like he won't even let his friends get it for free. He'll be like, I'm sorry, I have to charge you a dollar. Like if your venue is directly next to his house and all you want him to do is walk through the door. (laughs) dollar. But he'll call you for two hundred dollars or you can get a hug for free for anyone. Very sweet. Um, A quick a quick like complaint about the whole nerdcore genre thing. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I like that you like, started this saying, I don't like nerdcore, so I'm going to be quiet. But yeah, here's a complaint about the I'm genre. I'm really judgmental and like to talk, so, you know. Please do, because I have a lot of judgmental um, clips of MC Chris, and I didn't want to be, like, the only <laughs> shitty one. I felt a lot better once I saw he apologized, but... I don't I don't mind I don't mind him so much. It's uh, the, the genre as a general leans really hard on the nerd stuff. But, like, I'm a fan of old hip-hop, and, like, a lot of old hip-hop has nerd references, doesn't it? Like, Dr. Dre does uh, Transformers references and stuff like that. It's not... And it, it always struck me as sort of weird that they were trying to distance themselves from that when, like... I don't know. Like, like for example, a lot of nerdcore does the thing where they, like, make fun of people uh, using using poor grammar in songs. Which is kind of racist. Kind of racist? Yeah. Only kind of. Only kind of. It's only kind of. Yeah, no, nerdcore has a huge racism problem. Yeah. Like, as a genre. Not necessarily the people not necessarily not, not, the not, people who are doing it but the way that it is talked about by these news sources that mc chris hates and also it's less that and more of kind of an elitism problem yeah i think that we can say that we think that nerdcore has a has a had a racism problem especially given uh it's race wars tour chill out it's not about a bunch of races killing each other live <laughs> although that sounds pretty good and that could happen so go check out my live show this fall race wars tour jokes that were funny in 2011 they might have not been in 2011 yeah might not have been funny then yeah but for different reasons yeah um but i have a funny moment from mc chris's uh, first song that he performed. Well, all right, stop the track. Stop the track. For some reason, I was distracted while I was rapping, and I forgot what my rap words were. But I think I've collected myself. I'm going to do another song. Get up. <laughs> we'll do the next song if that's all right, gentlemen in the booth. Shit's on Rob Malone, the world's greatest dancer. He distracted me while my eyes were closed. You figure it out. And then earns himself the jerk face song. We're friends from back in the day. I can Eleven just take, years ago, take over your show in three seconds and do whatever get out. you want. Yeah. And then I'm gonna push her over and no, eat no. that fish. <laughs> <laughs> Usually reserved for callers. And you know what's funny about everybody in that band is 
they're my friends, so they know for real that I'm really a jerk. And so while they're singing that song, they're like, this has got a little bit too much truth. Sorry, I think... it, it just it reminded me of when Paul Shear and Jason Van Zuckers yeah. really did take over the show in three seconds. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's why I saved that quote. <laughs> I'm like, he's prophetic. He Friends is an oracle. of Chris Gethard can take over his show. And also racism is still very real in the world today. We have another really fun fail for the episode. So George. Yeah, George Caraman. Has a random rant about Jet Li and the fact that they're not going to go to the Miss America con. Miss Universe. Miss Universe. Um, Again, prophetic Miss Universe contestants being harassed. Um, I mean, that was definitely already happening. It's through. Get over it. What just happened? That was basically what the entire audience was wondering as well. Are we going to talk about Human Crane 2 at all? Yeah. so So Banana Man this time was directing the Human Crane. And Hot Dog was helping hold Chris up because in the first human crane, they almost dropped him on his head. <laughs> and it still goes so awry that after pulling up a signed, his own signed headshot with his teeth, Gethard calls off the human crane for the rest of the show. And this is the first time they've just abandoned a bit halfway through the episode. This show thus far has been plagued by technical snafus. MC Chris is on his smartphone. <laughs> it is a smartphone. I have another announcement. We're not doing that human crane thing anymore. All we accomplished was that. We couldn't shoot it well, and I just kept hitting my head. You do um, think that that human crane segment was the first time Chris says banana man? Because he's been in, the, sh- on the, he's been in mm. the audience before, but I think this is the first time Chris refers to Keith as banana man on the show. Hmm. Do you think that Banana Man like told Chris like, hey, you should call me Banana Man so that it seems more like he's part of the show so that he can better woo the love of his life, Bethany Hall? I yes. Mean, sure. Yes. Um. In in more celebration of things failing, I just really liked the exhausted Chris trying to answer the phone after almost getting dropped on his head. Do we have mm-hmm. a caller on the line? No. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I'm who's here. this? Who's this? What's up? Who's this? Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. What what do you want? Hi, this about? is Jackie. What's up? <laughs> he just seems so tired. We have Jackie who called. She takes Adderall and cleans her apartment when she can't sleep. We'll all eat a bunch of Adderall and clean. Yeah. <laughs> she invites everyone over to her apartment. Uh, everyone on the panel, everyone in the studio audience, everything. Well, are... Shannon says that Jean can use her trust fund to buy everything that they need to host the show at Jackie's apartment. And Jean immediately says no, because she won't have any money left because she's going to use her trust fund to pay Carl Rove to get Connor a- a- elected president of the United States. But then we, of course, see our wonderful uh, cornmeal machine. Uh, our loan cornmeal our machine loan because cornmeal we have no machine. others the only one that we have um and it's about time oh no i'm dead and it just it follows a dead person as he uh goes through his afterlife eventually to um i'm gonna cut open your scrotum oh, oh, oh God damn it emily it was all just feet it was just a lot of shots of feet let's move on if you want a vision of the future <laughs> Imagine a scrotum being cut forever. (laughs) Uh, The next caller was Krista, who warns about how she also did a sleep study, which was less of a study and more of it sounded like two rich girls with a cabin in the woods, like torturing her for a weekend. Yeah, that sounded like sort of the core of the study. You never did tests on your friends? Not like that. I mean, I'm relieved to hear you didn't torture your friends so much they wanted to go kill a tree. Okay, yeah. So that's what happened is this girl got so paranoid that she thought that a tree outside the cabin was like a robber and then uh, attacked it. A girl who beat the shit out of the tree? (laughs) I think that's a good call. I mean, normally I'm really like docile and nice. (laughs) Don't trust anyone that ever says that to you ever. (laughs) Um, it's at this point in the show that Patrick points out how creepy the calls have been 
And MC Chris uh, has an interesting suggestion. You could, edit, you could edit this episode into the ring. So guess what I did, you guys? Guess what I did today? You edited it into the grudge? You have to turn down your TV if you don't mind. Um, it, it, it is down. I don't have anything playing right now. There's a condition where you can get up, walk around, but still be sleeping. People get killed. Right, he was bleeding a little bit, bleeding a little bit. She walks in late at night. Look at me. Look at me. <laughs> I didn't hear him coming in. Hey, does it die? Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Damn, I don't have anything playing right now. I don't have anything playing right now. We stayed up for like three days straight. People get killed. Oh, what are you <laughs> All right. <laughs> I get out of my bed. You don't get out of my bed. You don't get out of my bed. You don't get out of my bed. And one of my eyes turned. turned. My eyes turned. My eyes turned. You have no idea what's going on. Do we have a caller on the line? Caller on the line? Caller on the line? And I just run out. Are you outside? Right, I'll call you all right next week. Yo, Tom. And I stop right in front of the elevator. But I'm never going to die. I'm in so much pain. When you die, you see the But I'm never going to die. My eyes turned off. My eyes turned off. My eyes turned off. Chill out! But I'm never gonna die. Chill out! Please don't break my neck. My neck. Don't break my neck. Don't break my neck. Please don't break my neck. Oh no, I'm dead. Well, listeners, if this is the final episode, you know it's because Samara from The Ring came for us. In seven days. So Dylan from San Diego <laughs> called. And at this point, I think that he was the f- person who had been furthest geographically from the show to call in. Is that true? Yeah. Chris said at that point, I think. Doesn't he say something about it? Uh, no, I think he just he gets really excited. Okay. Yeah, I think at this point he was the farthest because Stellan hadn't called in yet. And it was still mostly like limited to the east coast or the east side of the country like because the pennsylvania is i count that but it's not on the east coast yeah yeah uh and it's at that point that um a rivalry perhaps between the human fish and gene be is explored uh he had rejected a gift of a seal from her a cute little seal stuffed toy in a previous episode um and shannon points out the real problem is that uh the human fish knew about her trust fund and was wondering why he didn't bring her no, no, no. Sh- she said she should have brought a real seal it wasn't that the human fish knew uh then ben calls in with the best advice of the show of how to fix his sleep schedule one milligram of melatonin Anyone else tried melatonin? I have. Yeah. No, I tried NyQuil once. I almost pooped myself. But... <laughs> <laughs> That's a true story, too. Really? Really? Yeah, yeah. I had NyQuil and, like, I'm a little guy, and I had NyQuil and, like, like woke up, like, like literally seconds away from pooping. Like, the poop was coming out before my butt hit the toilet. Like, it was... <laughs> it was had a, had I stayed asleep like a second longer, like that would have been disastrous. <laughs> we then get a call from our favorite caller, Sean Diston of Smoke Weed Sun fame. Yo, son. And a terrible tragedy occurred. A tragedy of which you can hear the clip uh, in my The Ring edit, but not as an individual clip. He's out of weed, son. Damn, son. Uh, we then get a call from someone who has actual night terrors. Night terrors. Different from sleep paralysis. Yes. Yeah. Much different. Yeah. It's when you wake up and you're like actually like hallucinating. Um, or not wake up, but get up and have hallucinations. Um, well, you do with sleep paralysis too, but you also can't move. Yeah. So this person like had a kind of convoluted story of just sort of waking up and running out of a hotel room and then like collapsing in front of the elevator and their friend being like what the fuck is happening fun fact this is um what they think a lot of like earlier cases of like possession were Mm. is people having sleep paralysis and night terrors 
Mm, that, that makes, makes a lot like of sense. Because like I said, I've had, I've had sleep paralysis, and it feels like some evil entity is in the room. And yeah, so then we just get a, we get a last caller who compliments Random Jean. I think Random Jean has been on fire this episode. He asks she was. Her, she was kind of killing it. She was great. She really was. She really was. Uh, they asked um, what was on her mind, and she said, MC Chris or Chris Gethard. Who wins? MC Chris. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Holy fuck. I can't believe I cut off Shannon saying holy fucking shit. <laughs> but that's what she said, in case any of you are curious. And that's pretty much the end of the episode. We go out with a MC Chris song. This song's about Boba Fett. He's from Star Wars. That's Rome in space, in case you didn't know what that was. And that's basically the end of this episode, which means it's time for our special segment, starting with mine, MV NPC. I love you! My favorite audience member. My favorite audience member at this time. It's gotta go to Rob Malone. I understand that you gotta dance crazy, but right next to me? Yes. <laughs> yes, right next to him. <laughs> go Rob Malone. It's now time for that canonical corner over there where canon happens. That's all you need to know. So I have three, Pat Castles, who was the guest and at this time was at College Humor, now writes for Full Frontal with Samantha B. Hmm. And he'll return to the Chris Gethard Show for the Night of Zero Laughs 3, which is episode 30, and the Night of Zero Laughs 2, which is episode 51. I think it's because there were multiple Nights of Zero Laughs on the stage show, and they were counting that numbering before realizing that's confusing. And just numbering them based on the public access show. The Human Crane will return on episode 50, the one year anniversary show. Mike Birbiglia, who appeared on the TCGS episode Flying Knives and Animal Heads with Mike Birbiglia and Marcus Monroe, made a movie about his experience with night terrors and sleepwalking called Sleepwalk With Me. And Gethard was also in his movie Don't Think Twice, as was Connor Ratliff. So he's the Kevin Bacon of Gethard co Connections. He's also the Kevin Bacon of that one time that we met Chris Gethard at a Mike Birbiglia show. Oh, that's show. true. Why didn't I bring that up? Yeah. That was a way better thing. We saw Chris Gethard open for Mike Birbiglia in Santa Cruz. With a Thank God for Laughs, which is on Netflix. Yes. Watch it. It's great. It's a great special. And that means that it is time for our final segment of tonight. The final segment, Judge Robin's Scorecard all rise for the Honorable Judge Robin. And be seated. All right, everyone. I'm Judge Robin, and it's time for my segment where I act like the guy who's too cool for the party and judge you all silently from the corner. So, uh, Jean got negative one point for nonchalantly mentioning she has a trust fund. Uh, <laughs> Shannon got a point for advocating masturbation. Uh Pat got one point for uh, his Venture Brothers shirt that he was wearing. I'm a big Venture Brothers fan. Mm -hmm. uh, he got another one for the quote, I'll be fine is the title of a Lifetime original movie. <laughs> uh, oh, Shannon got a second point for uh, now that I know you have a trust fund, you should have bought him a real seal. <laughs> <laughs> and MC Chris got a trust fan, got a trust fund. MC Chris got a point for uh, being the only musical guest that I can remember for joining the panel and then lost it with Sunisi said the race war comment. <laughs> and the winner of the of this show <clears throat> and the winner of this show with a whopping seven points was uh, was was Chris Gether himself for uh, shutting down the crane game after he realized that it was not a good bit. <laughs> and he gets seven points for it. Yeah, seven points that one. Yeah. I'd agree with for that. All the, for all the times he did not bump his head after that. Yeah. <laughs> I uh, I have no objections to your points list. Um, but if you did have any, they'd be overruled. <laughs> but the final question is, fans of this show who, are, who may not have watched all of the public access episodes, would you advise that they watch this episode? It's... It's good for the calls. It's bad for the game. Yeah. I would actually suggest that they watch this specifically for the game. 
What? Because it comes back later on the one year. Uh, and I think that your appreciation of the fact that they managed to successfully pull it off will be so much greater if you see <laughs> how much it didn't work this time. So if that's the kind of thing you're into, watch this episode and then feel better about it in a year or just skip it. I'd skip it. I like how our different philosophies about which episodes you should watch are starting to emerge. Yeah. <laughs> if you're yeah, not a- I like I like the funny ones. <laughs> I like the world building. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but thank you, everyone, for listening to this episode of We Are Trash People. We hope you enjoyed it. I am now going to, uh, instead of playing us out to anything, we're cutting straight to Forest Keeper of the Canon, who is going to tell us where we can catch our favorite Chris Gethard show, Alumine, uh in the wide world of comedy, TV, and streaming services right now. So you should watch the trailer for Los Spookies, which is a trippy horror-themed show created by Fred Armisen and TCGS writers Julio Torres and Ana Fabrega. And you can hear Connor Ratliff on the first episode of the sci-fi podcast Boarding Party with Jackie Jennings, where he talks all about Star Wars and delves into the psyche of George Lucas. And I also think you should check out Chris Gethard's Spotify playlists that he's been making while he's taking care of his brand new baby boy. Uh, thank you all for listening. We will see you next time. It's Wednesday night. It's Wednesday night.